I don't like when Kim introduces me because it puts way too much pressure on me. But you see how I match? See, I got that all down pat. You want to know the real reason? I only have one nice shirt. And that's the truth. So we'll give everybody a chance to come on back in, but this is great. Thanks so much for coming out. And as always, you know, this is my, actually, I don't even know how many years. I think 18 or 19 years coming to the Money Show and doing, you know, everything from keynote to everything else to standing in the booth and doing what very few CEOs would do, but it's been the amount of relationships and things like that. It's incredible. But I've been talking on air all week. I do a show every single day from, um, from uh, 7 in the morning till 10 in the morning Central Time. And, uh, and then a little bit in the afternoon and then all these shows, about 25 or 27 shows a year around the country. And every, and I think for the last, I don't even know how many times I've been to this, this Omni, but one of the things I've been talking about all week is that um, if you have a chance here, this hotel has the most amazing omelet maker down in the restaurant downstairs. And I've been coming to the same woman making the same omelets for at least 15 years. And every time I always tease Tony and the guys back in the office that I'm going to ask her what her opinion is on the markets because nobody's better tuned in to certain commodities than she is. So if you get a chance, anyway, that's fun. But I have a short, um, unfor uh, we're running a little bit late, so I will move quickly through this presentation. Every year I do a brand new presentation. I don't, um, I don't like to reuse anything, so I try some things. And, and since Orlando's the first show of the year, I call this one my test pancake. It's kind of, um, you know what a test pancake is. You throw the first pancake down, and then you throw it to the dog, and that's your test pancake. That's kind of what I do for the show. Um, and I kind of went a little bit different direction today, so hopefully you'll like it. And it's, uh, I think the slides are up here, perfect. Went a little bit different direction. Going to cover a lot of different topics. Going to move through it really quickly. But I'm going to start it off with just a, a kind of a, just a little story. And it's current events type of thing. So I, I did a show in Chicago last, week, uh, last weekend or two weekends ago. Did a show in Chicago. And I started the show off by talking about something. And I want to just bring up the same topic for a quick second. I, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, uh, a reliever on the New York Yankees. Adam Adovino, he's, um, he's like a 27-year-old reliever. He's pretty good, makes like $30 million over three, $10 million a year, something like that. Signed a contract, he's a late inning reliever. But he made the news for something really interesting. He made the news, the sports news in New York and the sports news around the country. Does anybody know why? Because he said, if I was pitching in 1934, I would have struck Babe Ruth out every single time. I don't think Babe Ruth could have hit 180 against me. I don't think Babe Ruth could have hit eight home runs a year if I was pitching down there. And I think if he went up against the pitchers we have today in Major League Baseball, I don't think Babe Ruth would be anything but a bust out. And he got in so much trouble. <laughs> All the baseball purists went crazy. Here's a guy questioning, you know, the house that Ruth built, essentially, and talking about something like, you know, he's a, $10 million a year in, in Major League Baseball is you're a middle of the road pitcher and you're a late inning reliever. And here he is saying, you know what? I got better stuff than Babe Ruth could ever hit. He wouldn't even touch me. I'd strike him out every single time. But I loved this discussion. Do you know why I love this discussion? Take a guess. Why do you think I love this discussion? Because it's the same thing as finance is today. It's exactly the same thing. You take somebody from 1950 or 1960 or 1970 or 1980 or 1990 or even 2000, and you say, do what you did in 1980, 1990 or 2000 and try to do it today, and you come up with zero. We'll strike them out every single time. It's a whole different environment today. And I'm going to get into this, and this is part of my discussion, but not only is the content better, not only is the technology better, not only is the fees different, everything's different. We're talking about marketplace efficiency. Anybody that was trying to make money, quote, the old-fashioned way, buy them, hold them, go to sleep for 30 years, it's done. It's over. It doesn't work that way anymore. You might hate this because, because this is something that I usually raises a lot of red flags when people hear me say this. But um, recently, Jack Bogle passed away. And he's the father of, you know, um, index funds, saving people billions of dollars. Here's a crazy argument that I love to use. 
he did save people billions of dollars, and there's a lot of people that invested in index funds. At the same time, we lost two generations of active investors. We lost two generations of decision makers. We have become a passive, a crazy passive society when it comes to investors, when it comes to risk takers. Do you know today's millennials open, more, open fewer businesses than a decade ago and fewer businesses than a decade before that? They take less risk, there's less entrepreneurship. There's less commitment to, on a percentage basis, on an adjusted percentage basis to capital. Our kids don't take risk. They spend, but they don't take risk. We've lost an entire generation of decision makers because everybody's become a passive investor. I do not come to these money shows, and I haven't for 19 straight years, to talk about the virtues of passive investing, to talk about the virtues of mutual funds, the virtues of ETFs, the virtues of buying something, holding something, closing your eyes. The whole reason I come here and the whole reason I get excited about having these discussions and the whole reason I get fired up when Kim makes a really nice introduction is because everybody here is smart. Everybody here can, can learn and appreciate and engage in the power of decision making, which leads to a ridiculous amount of success over time, regardless of the business or regardless of where you are in life. And that's something that's so cool. It's a pretty heavy introduction, right? Sorry about that. Got all fired up today. Just did a class with about two or three hundred kids from different universities here, and you know, it's the same kind of thing. Like, you know, I'm telling them, you're 22, 21, 18 years old, you know, get off your butt and take some risk. Get off and butt, start your own business. Get off your butt and do whatever you want to do, but just take some risk. Anyway, I called today's, in your brochure, it has a title for today's discussion, and it was something that I wrote three or four months ago. And I know that Kim's gonna be mad at me, but I changed the title. Sorry about that. <laughs> Troublemakers and small-time crooks. There was a Woody Allen movie called Small-Time Crooks, but um, I kind of want to talk about creative troublemakers as a good thing, and small-time crooks, maybe not so small-time, as a bad thing. And so bear with me. I will go through it quickly, and we'll get you into the show you know, in time for it to uh, when it opens, the exhibit hall. So the common thread between successful investors, traders, opportunistics, is the original idea. We downplay, we underplay, we, we don't give enough credit to the original idea. Individualism is the key to wealth creation. How do you create wealth? You stand alone, you stand aside, you do something different than everybody else. That's the key. So why not us? It is a random Thursday, what month is this? February, it's a random Thursday. In fa I never know what month it is. I don't know anything about much about anything. I don't even know my kid's birthday. So but somehow I remember lots of different trades. It's a random Thursday in February, and it's as good a time to start as any to take that approach on how important individualism is with respect to taking risk and making decisions. And I'll explain why, and that's the, the basis of this. Great technology, efficient markets, and low fees, they're all wonderful. In fact, we've had a big part in building the best technology in the world, in building and reducing fees as low as they can get to, and in creating really cool content and efficient markets. But that's not enough. Success requires hardcore differentiation. People look at me and they say, how did you start two businesses worth, you know, a billion and a half dollars? And I'm like, I don't know, but I'm really different than everybody else. What is the differentiator then? Or what is the differentiation? Is it better news? No. Is it better charts? No. Is it better analysis? No. Is it better experts? Hell no. Is it faster technology? Absolutely not. No, 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 and no. So, believe it or not, I feel like it's the creative troublemaker who eventually crushes the commoditized small-time crook. And I'll get into what I mean by that. So we have become a very social society. Just think about what you do on an everyday basis and think how social we become. We learn, we chat, we watch, and we interact socially all day long on our phone, on our computer, on our iPad, on our laptop, whatever it is. Every, every vehicle we use is social interaction now. Everybody's, I'm, I am as bad as everybody else looking at my phone the entire time, looking at my iPad, on my computer. You know, we have become a very social society. And everything we do is in this social context. But social learning has now become a derivative of AI, which is artificial intelligence, 
It's become a derivative of machine learning, which is another word for artificial intelligence, or collective intelligence, as we like to call it. But where is the value for true wealth creation? If everybody does the same thing, okay, and everybody is social that way, where's the real value for wealth creation? Let's think about this for a quick second. So where's the individualism? Now we all do the same stuff, the same way, at the same time. We are a passive society. Think about it. Think about your life. Think about being passive. How many times have you woke up in the morning and said, you know what, today I'm going to go out there and be passive. Today I'm going to go out and hire somebody that's totally passive. You know what, kids, I want you guys to be passive when you grow up. We've become a society that has lost the ability to quantify the magnitude of opportunity because we don't take risk. We don't make decisions. We don't make monetary decisions. We don't make emotional decisions. We don't make decisions. We don't take risk. We compromise. So we've lost the ability to quantify the magnitude of opportunity. That's why there's less entrepreneurs. That's why there's less successful businesses. So there is a difference when choosing a restaurant, which can be totally social. You want to, you want to go to a restaurant, you look up online. I don't ever mention Yelp because they stole my logo, but if you, if you want to look at some site and see, hey, you know what, how's this restaurant look, or what's this movie like, sure, go ahead, be social, go check Rotten Tomatoes or whatever else it is, and make a decision based on the, this, the, somebody else quantifying you know, uh, from, from some social inputs. But nobody really cares whether or not you saw a good movie or a bad movie based on social input. Or nobody cares if you saw, went to a good restaurant or a bad restaurant based on input that you took from other people. But when it comes to risk and making money, everyone should care. So let's get into the differentiation piece. So efficient markets, which is everything we face it, stocks, options, um, futures, futures options, Bitcoin, Cash markets, cash FX, it doesn't matter what it is. Every single market place today is efficient because there's an incredible amount of money seeking returns. And because of that, every marketplace where there's customer capital or professional capital is efficient. So efficient markets, if you think about that, offer the least amount of theoretical edge and the most amount of herd risk. So this is a new term, herd risk. So what is herd risk? Herd risk is the risk of everybody doing the same thing at the same time. Again, we become this social society. And in this social society, we're all doing the same thing. It's not the same as picking a movie or going, picking a restaurant based on social input. This, we're now talking about herd risk, which, which is essentially a byproduct of efficient markets. It's basically everybody watching the same movie and doing the same thing because they see the same thing that everybody else sees. And that is where opportunity contracts. So social or collective intelligence, when plotted against random efficiency, there's a lot of big stuff in here. This is about as heavy as I get in my whole life, and trust me, I don't get that heavy. Social or collective intelligence, when plotted against random efficiency, because I believe markets are random, I believe there's no such thing as technical analysis, there's no such thing as fundamental analysis, there's no such thing as political analysis, there's any of that stuff, just throw it in the garbage. I believe markets are random. And when you plot, when you plot efficiency against randomness, you'll deliver this negative expected value because everybody's on the same side all the time. So if everybody does the same thing all the time, everybody can't win because it doesn't work that way. And so that efficiency creates this negative herd impact. So what does that mean? So how do you do avoid the herd risk of the new social marketplace? And this is going to get back to the individualism discussion. This is going to get back to being a differentiator. This is going to get back to being a decision maker and also being independent of everybody else. This is going to get back to standing alone. This is going to get back to thinking for yourself and recognizing that everybody else is watching exactly the same movie. Forget the trend is your friend garbage. That's, does it, there's no statistical evidence for that. Forget the fact that something's down so you buy it or something's up so you sell it. That's just a gambler's fallacy. So how do you avoid the herd risk of the new social marketplace? That's cool. You don't bet on the small-time crooks. 
You stop betting on the passive small-time crooks. So what does that mean? Who are these so-called small-time crooks? They are masters of the obvious, such as financial news groups like CNBC, Bloomberg, Reuters, Dow Jones, Wall Street Journal. I know, you know, I don't, I don't hold anything back, man. It's just, it's out there. I'll take, my, I'll take my punches. But I don't believe they're being disingenuous. Okay, I don't believe that. They simply perpetuate collective hurting and failure because they don't want to do anything different that risks advertising dollars. When your entire model is built on advertising dollars, then you can't afford to be, you can't afford to take any risk, so you go with the collective herd. And because of that, again, it's not disingenuous, it's just all you know because that's what pays the bills. They are fee-obsessed. Who are these small-time crooks? They are fee-obsessed asset managers like BlackRock, like Vanguard, UBS, State Street, Fidelity, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, and everybody else that sells low-grade annuities, loaded mutual funds, expensive managed futures, front-end loaded real estate, trusts, and in addition to charging excessive brokerage fees. They're all of the above. And when I say that, it's because these are, when I say small-time crooks, these are huge companies, giant companies. But they'll nickel and dime you. And they'll nickel and dime you through every, everything from bait and switch to products that they sell to everything else. I don't mean to offend anybody. I'm just telling you the way it is, the way I look at it. If you thought you were getting a rah-rah speech, you're not. The average fee structure of 2.5%, I know people say, oh my God, it's way less than that time now. I can quote six different firms and the average fee structure is 63 basis points. It's 63 basis points, just like when Las Vegas says, you know what the odds of you winning this hand are? 5248, good luck. Play as much money as you have and try to get 5248 and walk out of there with just losing 2%. Not possible, but anyway. The average fee structure of 2.5%, if it averages out to that over a, a lots and lots of hundreds of millions of people, is 34% of a 7% annual return and 85% of risk-free rates, which are basically treasury returns. And when you start to think about numbers in that regard, you will understand why these firms make, you know, seven, seven billion a month or 17 billion a quarter and 50 billion a year and all that stuff. And then you wonder, how the hell do they almost go bankrupt? Because they ain't that bright. They're just small-time crooks. Again, when you play these numbers out, 2.5% is 34% of an annualized return of 7%. So what is 2.5% if the market's down like it was last year? What is 85% of a 3% return when you're paying 2.5%? You're lucky to break even. Zero. STK is my, I'm sorry, STC is my new acronym for small-time crooks. Small-time crooks are one-hit wonders or they are bull market, one-hit wonders or, or bull market um, type of hedge funds where they just track indexes. Hedge funds do great when the market goes up and they do really crappy when the market goes down. And so we have firms that I like naming firms like Greenlight, like QIM, and then you can go through you know, um, uh, different years through Tepper, through Ackman and whoever else you want. But you know what? Charging two and 20 for speculating with your money is ridiculous. And if people are dumb enough to do it, then you deserve what's coming to you. But I also don't like scam-like newsletter writers who offer false paper trading results or who try to get you to buy different penny stocks. These are all small-time crooks and it bothers the hell out of me. Small-time crooks are the unethical companies too big to fail that always seem to be given second and third chances. Companies like Wells Fargo, which is the kingpin of them all, but also all big banks for that matter. Volkswagen, even poorly managed companies like IBM, GE, GM, and AIG. You know, IBM just had its first uptick in about 17 years. When I first got on the trading floor, they used to say IBM was the most, 1981, the most actively traded stock on the floor of the SIBO was IBM. And the stock was trading for about 160 bucks. They said, sell the 180s and buy a Mercedes. Well, the stock still won $30, $130. It's only been 40 years. So, you know, when you think about it, 20 consecutive down quarters, and they finally had an up quarter. That's a horribly run company, period. You know, and we got to start thinking like that. And people start to start thinking a little bit differently. So. Overpaid board members, overpaid CEOs, unequal distributions of wealth, unequal distributions of ownership, and a reluctance to split stock because everybody wants to maintain control and investing only in stock buybacks so that you do continue to maintain control and push stock prices higher. Listen, I'm a free market capitalist, not a socialist, 
I'm a free market capitalist. I, I love trading. I love the markets. I've spent my entire life, and I still trade, you know, whatever it is, a, a, a few hundred million dollars of notional equivalency of my own money every single week. So this is what I do. And unlike anybody else that runs these companies, I promise you, nobody trades that much. I'm a junkie. And so I love free markets. But when, when we say that, you know what? I'm really tired of the way some of these companies get free passes. So how do you do it? So who are the creative troublemakers? Who are the good guys that will face the herd and stand alone? Besides me. <laughs> the easy answer is the outlier founders and CEOs who innovate and disrupt. And this is a very short list, don't worry. I have a million more, but Elon Musk, Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, these are outliers, but it's not scalable. It's not repeatable. You know, you can't get somebody, you know, what Jeff Bezos did is not repeatable what, or scalable. What, what Elon Musk did is not repeatable. So that doesn't matter. So those are outliers. And forget about outliers. Because outliers to the downside, outliers to the upside, that's the whole concept of kind of when, when randomness doesn't work is there's a few outliers on the far ends of the tail. But the important group to acknowledge are the unknown professors in academia driving home math skills, driving home fundamental STEM skills to end in order to drive teaching and finance. This is scalable. As we begin to, as we begin to update, as we begin to, to cultivate curriculum, as we begin to add math into a logic chain when it comes to finance. Finally, let's get done teaching that stocks go up because of there's some fundamental reason or stocks go down because of some technical reason. Let's start teaching, hey, you know what? Here's an expected move and here's the math behind it because this makes damn sense to everybody. Let's stop saying that, hey, you know what? This year, I think the S&Ps are gonna go to 3,200. 3, when we should be saying, you know what? The expected move in the S&Ps this year from where they closed last year is plus or minus you know, whatever it is, 300 S&P points. So from 2,400 to 2,700. That's the expected move over the course of the year. I'm just ballparking it, but that's what we should be saying. Because there is a math equation for something, and there is a marketplace that's efficient to support that math equation. Alternative digital financial media is at the forefront of disruption. Opportunistic strategic content that is product indifferent and that is math driven is also repeatable. This is what we do every single day, but there's, we're just at the beginning you know, when we launched our first trading platform 20 years ago, everybody said, A, nobody will trade derivatives, and B, nobody will trade them actively. Today, every firm out there, the majority of their business now is active trading in derivatives. That's the majority of their transactional business. Do you know how many people trade stocks with us now? Do you know how many people percent trade stocks with us? 3%. Do you know why? There's nothing wrong with stocks. They're just too damn expensive. So why wouldn't you use something that's more capital efficient and trade something where, you know what, instead of putting up uh, $200,000 to make a trade, you can put up $250. That's why people trade derivatives. So you need to be, so what we need to do is to introduce people to strategic, creative, differentiate them. Strategic, creative um, innovation when it comes to finance. You need to be different. We are smart people. I say this all the time. Everybody in this room, you're here on a random Tuesday, on a random Thursday, like I said. It is, and we're all smart. You're here to learn how to build wealth. And you're, learn, you're here to learn how to build wealth from people, some people here that have been very successful doing it, and others that are really interesting to listen to. It's all a good combination. It's all a great mix. So we're smart people. Create an intellectual challenge, and people will try anything. Every time we've disrupted a business, whether it's financial media, or whether it's financial software, or whether it's the brokerage industry, it's all because we were willing to challenge people. Traditional small-time crooks, as I like to say, are not willing to make that, to, to develop that challenge and to engage people in that challenge. We do it every single day. So where are the customer Teslas? One of the first books I ever read were the customer yachts. 1940, one of the greatest, one of, one of, one of the better books, let's just say, on, I don't want to say the greatest, one of the better books on finance ever written. 1940 book, Where are the Customer Yachts? Customer of, I believe it was Morgan Stanley at the time, walked outside, took a look in, down at Battery Park in New York and asked his broker, hey, where are the customer yachts? There weren't any customer yachts, okay? So today, like I said, markets move. It's a little bit different. Everything's different. Where are the customer Teslas? Well, the difference today is that 
they're a lot more attainable than yachts were in 1940. We live in an efficient marketplace now. The, the every, virtually every single tradable marketplace that's fungible and centrally cleared is efficient. Virtually anything you want to do to be different, to take advantage of high volatility, to take advantage of price extreme, to take advantage of whatever kind of strategy you want to apply, it's a virtual, there's virtual zero give up to theoretical. So for the first time, that customer Tesla is more attainable than ever before. How's that for speed? <laughs> it's, it's 617. Um, my name is Tom Sosnoff. I am the CEO of Tasty Trade, and well, I'll be in the booth for the next two days. And I'm also speaking, doing a futures, little future symposium tomorrow at 11 o'clock. We have our whole team here. You're invited to come on out, talk to everybody, challenge us. And you know the coolest thing about what we do is no question is off limits. No question. You want to know what kind of omelet I eat? Just ask later on. See you tomorrow. See you, see you tonight. Thanks so much.